Hello and welcome to this Oak Tree English video on features of 19th century language. This will be of great help to GCSE students and significant interest to others. Bill Bryson once wrote that to find a snake, you can look behind the changing meanings of a word. Living languages change and develop over time. Just think about words that used to mean one thing but now mean the exact opposite. For example, bad used to mean morally deficient. Then it came to mean really good in the 1980s, so much so that Michael Jackson sang with pride that he was bad. Today it's reverted to its original meaning, making Michael Jackson's statement true. This change has taken place over my lifetime. How much more can we expect language to have shifted over two centuries? In this video, we're going to look at five areas which typify 19th century writing, with examples from literature and poetry. These five are formality, devices, content, references, and romanticism. What do we mean by the 19th century anyway? I'm glad you asked. It's the period from 1800 to 1899, any year with an 18 in front of it. It was a period of astonishing change and development, including the end of the Industrial Revolution. Here are a few important dates to give you a flavour of what was happening at the time. When the century began, the big name in Europe was Napoleon Bonaparte. This little Corsican rose to prominence after the bloodshed of the French Revolution and proceeded to terrorise Europe. Fortunately, he was opposed by the British, who destroyed his naval capability at Trafalgar in 1805, and finally finished him off at Waterloo in 1815. Around a similar time, Britain had a new monarch who was committed to the arts. He later became George IV, but at this time he was Prince Regent, uh, covering for his father, who had gone crazy. Jane Austen also published her classic Pride and Prejudice against that backdrop, hence the military reference in that work. The next big news was a, a huge step forward in human morality over human greed, in that the abominable practice of slavery was abolished throughout the British Empire, thanks to William Wilberforce. In 1837, the 18-year-old Princess Victoria ascended the throne to become the longest reigning monarch until Queen Elizabeth II recently overtook her. Victoria remained monarch for the rest of the century and brought with her a literary shift from Romanticism to Victorianism. It was a reign which saw some of the best names in English literature, including Charles, Dar Charles Dickens, uh, Charlotte, Emily and Anne Bronte, the Bronte sisters. And let's not forget Lewis Carroll, author of uh, Alice in Wonderland. It also saw the publication of the wildly controversial Descent of Man by Charles Darwin, which started a trend towards scientism, which culminated with the fallacy riddled modern work of Richard Dawkins. On a more positive note, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle also started writing Sherlock Holmes. I hope this gives you a broad picture of what we're talking about when we refer to the 19th century. It is only a very rough sketch. Oscar Wilde was there too. One of the most striking differences between 19th century and modern language is the formal register. This has changed from when I was a child to today. I would never have imagined calling my friends' parents by their first names. They were always Mr. and Mrs. A, and in fact still are to, 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 to this day. But nobody calls me Mr. English, only my first name, Oak Tree. We can see evidence of this in the eloquence they used. For example, in Pride and Prejudice, it is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. There was also a focus on politeness and manners, which seems strange to us in our more 
informal age. Here's an example from Sense and Sensibility. Again, Jane Austen. I come here with no expectations, only to profess, now that I am at liberty to do so, that my heart is and always will be yours. Honorifics were used a lot more, particularly where rank was a consideration. For example, again drawn from Pride and Prejudice, uh, Mr. Darcy bowed but did not speak, and Mr. Collins, who was blessed with a pride that neither his age nor his inclination had dint, affirmed that he had rather have been presented to her ladyship, meaning Lady Catherine de Bourgh, uh, her ladyship's view than to Miss Bennet's. Notice the use here of Mr. Darcy, Mr. Collins, her ladyship for Lady Catherine de Bourgh, and Miss Bennet, referring to Elizabeth Bennet. Finally, the pronouns used in the 19th century were a bit different. Some still used the archaic thou, thee, thy, thine pronouns, instead of the more generic and informal you, your, yours. For example, in Edgar Allan Poe's famous poem, The Raven, the narrator addresses the bird thus, Though thy crest be shorn and shaven, thou, I said, art shorn, O craven. Notice thy and thou in place of your and you, and art as the appropriate form of to be, where we would usually use are today, you are. What was our next area of difference? I'm sure we had one. Let's think. Ah, yes, devices. You've probably already noticed that the way the 19th century writers chose to phrase things is distinctly different from how we use language today. Let's look at a few differences and examples. We can start with the more ornate and elevated vocabulary. For example, let's take this example from A Tale of Two Cities by Dickens. Never did the sun go down with a brighter glory on the quiet corner in Soho than one memorable evening when the doctor and his daughter sat under the plane tree together. A Tale of Two Cities. Dickens also had a masterful way of phrasing and employing complex sentence structure such as his famous opening line from the same book, The Tale of Two Cities. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness. Which starts a long, complex sentence packed with ironically contradictory statements juxtaposed to each other in glorious Dickensian style. In The Raven, which we looked at a moment ago, we saw an example of the formal second person conjugation thou art. This is also seen in Tennyson's 1850 poem In Memoriam. Here's an example. Thou comest much wept for, such a breeze compelled thy canvas, and my prayer was as the whisper of an air to breathe thee over lonely seas. You note that come has the thou ending of st, comest. Archaic language was much more prevalent in the 19th century, though not commonly used in speech. An example of this is in Nathaniel Hawthorne's The Scarlet Letter. He hath done a wild thing ere now, this pious Mr. Master Dimsdale in the hot passion of his heart which is something you rarely hear down the pub on a Friday night. Uh, notice he hath done a wild, a wild thing, air meaning before. It's very exciting. Another thing that sets 19th century literature apart from older forms and to some agree, degree from modern writing is the content. For example, epistolary forms became popular. That is, writing as in a diary or a letter, an epistle. Think of the formulation of Dracula or Jane Eyre. Let me quote the opening lines from Bram Stoker's Dracula. 3rd of May, Bistritz, left Munich at 
8.35 p.m. on the 1st of May, arriving at Vienna early next morning. Should have arrived at 6.46, but the train was an hour late. You, you see what's going on here. Jonathan Harker is writing in his, his own personal shorthand. Uh, and that's, um, that is what makes it an authentic sounding piece. It was also at this time that regional accents and dialects became commonplace in literature. In Wuthering Heights, for example, the servant Joseph speaks in a broad Yorkshire dialect, which I cannot do without being wildly offensive. So I'm going to read what is written uh, and then translate it. What are ye for? he shouted. Tmaesters down in Twold. Go round by the end of Tlaith. If ye went to speak to him, which broadly translates to, what do you want? He shouted. The master's down in the fold, that is a sheep, sheep pen. Go round to the end of the barn, a lathe is a barn, if you want to speak to him. A key theme in Romanticism, which happened at the beginning of the 18th century, 19th century, is the use of nature. Detailed descriptions of landscapes and natural features exist alongside emotional reactions to them. For example, I'm sure we're all familiar with Wordsworth's daffodils. I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high o'er vales and hills, when all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils, beside the lake, beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze. There was an element of intertextuality in 19th century literature such as is less common in our less well-read era. There were common allusions to myths, legends, and the Bible. For example, Tennyson's Lady of Shalott uses characters and settings from Arthurian legend. Think of the last verse. Who is this and what is here? And in the lighted palace near died the sounds of royal cheer. And they crossed themselves for fear all the knights at Camelot. But Lancelot mused a little space. He said, she has a lovely face. God in his mercy lend her grace. The Lady of Shalott. Another thing that has changed or mutated since the 19th century is the strict morality of society. We used to know pretty well whether something was good or bad. Today, we all make up our own morality to suit ourselves. Back in the 19th century, morals were espoused as universally understood, and texts were often used to reinforce this belief. For example, Charlotte Bronte wrote in Jane Eyre, Conventionality is not morality. Self-righteousness is not religion. To attack the first is not to assail the last. Which is a lesson we can all learn from. Closely related to the moral teachings is the emphasis on social commentary. Nowhere is this more obvious than in the works of Charles Dickens. He paints a picture of, a, of Victorian London which showed, very unusually for the time, the squalor and poverty and deprivation of the average family. This is probably best shown in Oliver Twist, where an underfed orphan boy dares to speak up and says in words that have resonated down through the centuries, please, sir, I want some more. As mentioned at the beginning of this video, the early 1800s was the late end of the Romantic period of literature. Romanticism was marked out by a few things. I've already mentioned the deepened appreciation of the beauties of nature, but there was also an emphasis on emotion over reason. This is a pendulum which swings both ways over time. We're currently at the extreme zenith of an emotional swing, which will soon be overcompensated by a strong swing back to reason, hopefully not going down the crazy path of scientism like last time. An example from Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. She has the monster, Adam, say to Victor, uh, Victor Frankenstein, his creator. There's my head there. Your hours will pass in dread and misery, 
and soon the bolt will fall which must ravish from you your happiness for ever. Are you to be happy while I grovel in the intensity of my wretchedness? You can blast my other passions, but revenge remains. Revenge, henceforth dearer than light or food. I may die, but first you, my tyrant and tormentor, shall curse the sun that gazes on your misery. Beware, for I am fearless, and therefore powerful. I will watch with the wiliness of a snake, that I may sting with its venom. Man, you shall repent of the injuries you inflict. Romantic literature is also rich in figurative language, that's me again, using hyperbole, metaphor, personification and such like to good effect. Think of Byron's famous poem, She walks in beauty like the night, of cloudless climes and starry skies, and all that's best of dark and bright, meet in her aspect and her eyes. Another aspect of later Romanticism, which is easily overlooked, is what Encyclopaedia Britannica calls a predilection for the exotic, the remote, the mysterious, the weird, the occult, the monstrous, the diseased, and even the satanic. I've just called this weirdness. Now you can think of Frankenstein or Dracula or Edgar Allan Poe, whose poem The Raven we mentioned. Even Wuthering Heights and Jane Eyre express love in terms of soul. And one even features ghosts. But you have to read both to find out which one. You can thank me later. You can reread The Lady of Shalott or watch my video of it and look at the use of fairies and magic. I shall gift you this quote from Samuel Taylor Coleridge's poem, poem Kubla Khan. You know the one in Xanadu did Kubla Khan a stately, stately pleasure dome decree where Alf the sacred river. Well, anyway, it, it later on goes on to describe a pl the place like this. A savage place, as holy and enchanted, as air beneath a waning moon was haunted by woman wailing for her demon lover. I hope this video has given you a flavour of 19th century language and culture. This should help you understand Romantic or Victorian writing, which feels a little strange to modern ears. If not, I hope that it's just been a lot of fun for you. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If so, please remember to like, share and subscribe or even become a channel member of Oak Tree English. Goodbye.